start and, um, and, and see how it goes, and if we need to adjust, we can. Um, my name's Ben Doyle. Uh, I'm the president of the Preservation Trust of Vermont, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that builds community through the preservation of historic buildings, villages, and downtowns. I work with Paul Costello a lot on kind of community visioning projects. I think mostly because in another life I was a high school English teacher, and I'm comfortable standing up in front of people and listening and, and watching the clock. And so that's really what my job here is tonight, right? Um, we're going to have a conversation about leadership, leadership systems in the in the city of Montpelier, and really a conversation about um, is it working? Does it need to be tweaked? What are ideas for fostering leadership in the community that can help us in this really singular moment? Right? We all know that whatever we're going to do is going to take you know, exceptional leadership. And so the question for us to consider is what does that really look like? And what can we do as a community? Right. The key thing here is we're not coming up with a list of 25 things for other people to do. Right. This is about what are the three or four things that we can all work collectively on to do together to move us forward in a positive direction. Okay. So. Um, my job, again, is really just to watch the clock, stir the drink, make sure that everybody who wants to speak gets the opportunity to do that. And so I'm going to be really kind of strict about the clock. You know, I think we need to just trust the process. And uh, what we're going to do is have about 15 minutes where we talk about what is the state of city leadership right now, or what has leadership looked like in response to the flood, what systems are working, uh, who has stepped up for leadership, um, all of those kinds of things. And then the next question we're going to ask ourselves is, you know, what, what could be different moving forward? Or what do we need to address moving forward or create or think about or collaborate on moving forward um, to make sure that we get the end outcomes that we want? And then the last thing we're going to do is really just prioritize, right? We're going to say, OK, we just came up with that list of 20 great ideas. And we can get none of them done. Or we can prioritize three and really try to, to move them forward. And it's just a preliminary thing. You know, all of these ideas, all of these there's notes being taken. Thank you again, Joan, for taking notes on this conversation. All of the conversations, there's going to be similar themes, right? If you're in the downtown session, leadership's going to come up. I'm sure the downtown's going to come up here, right? But all of that's going to be analyzed by Paul and the team. They're going to do a cluster analysis, find the points of overlap, and then raise those to the surface when we talk about prioritizing things at the next meeting, OK? So this is just a kind of preliminary uh, step for that. So we're going to do the what's going on right now for about 15 minutes. Uh, what, what do we need to do for the next, you know, uh, for about 30? And then we're going to spend the last 10 minutes kind of prioritizing. And then we're going to all go back to the House chamber and hear what everybody came up with. Any questions? David? We good? All right. Okay. All right. Great. Good. Let's start. So who wants to talk about um, leadership in, in coming out of the flood? What examples of great leadership did you see? Um, what did leadership look like? What does it look like right now? All of those things. I'm sorry, I've got my back together. No, I'm sorry, help me. Anybody want to start? My pillar alive. Yay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, tell me more about this. I was not in town when the flood hit. I was in at a conference in at UVM, so I witnessed it from afar. And seeing the organization and how quickly uh, Katie and others I know that supported Katie, but of course Montpelier Life was the the, the bullhorn. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of people involved in that effort. I know that. Uh, the, the volunteer. 2,000 people signed up in over a couple of days. You know, all that coordination was just spectacular. We heard from all over the country people seeing that and witnessing that in kind of an awe of the way that our community organized. Bravo to all those people. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Yes? Can I say, in addition to that, Parks Department, yay? Yeah. I don't think, yeah, I'm not sure how clear it was, but like all those Montpelier Live signs, Parks Department staff. Yeah, underneath all, it, it's all still those going. People that, that <laughs> just, such yeah. a team effort. Such a great team. I was in awe of Alec and Mark and Layla, who like just shifted us. I was with the Montpelier Youth Conservation Corps. And they just shifted us like seamlessly. It just plugged us in, and I was like, "Wow, you guys rock!" That's awesome. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that. Yes. I think one thing that made Montpelier Alive so successful is they had a. Um, uh, communication lines already open to all the mm -hmm. downtown businesses and so I think the line of communication is really important when we talk about leadership and they have it nailed down mm -hmm. both in an email list they have a Facebook group that she, she can talk to all the businesses um, and doing monthly or weekly meetings since the flood all have been great um, ways of communication that's great yeah so an established network it made it easy for them to kind of engage their leadership in that yeah. way yeah good what else? I mean, a means of communication that was great was Front Porch Forum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think a lot of people would go to it and mm -hmm. find out where things are, what was 
happening, what was going on, comments that went through that. Yeah. Great. Good. What else? I think um, social media was a supporting as well. Not everybody reads Front Porch Forum, mm -hmm. but the people who don't read Front Porch Forum probably look at Facebook. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of good communication there mm -hmm. as well. Can you talk about more like communication from whom? Um, to communication who? from Montpelier Live, communication mm -hmm. from the city, communication mm -hmm. from the business owners yeah. and residents. It, it was really coming from all all sides. Yeah, yeah. great. Good. So multiple vehicles for that exactly. communication, right? Exactly. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and to, to jump on that, the sort of social media, how are people talking to each other? Um, I have a, I'm on a signal thread, a chat thread that is mutual aid. That's usually like who has a you know pair of boots I can borrow, <laughs> and it just it blew up right, and so that was just I need three people here now to come help with this task. So and so from here is asking for this, um, and that was really cool to see that like work the way it is supposed to work. No leadership there, just who needs what, asking for it. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that because I find that like fascinating on multiple levels, right? And I will say like having visited some other communities and regions that are experiencing you know, extensive flooding damage, these mutual aid organizations are like critically important. Can you talk more about how it works here in Montpelier and the fact that what you just talked about, like disaggregated leadership, it sounds like? Yeah, um, there are people who know a lot more about mutual aid than I do. Um, I think that what was striking to me is I, uh, I ended up helping a couple people in really specific ways and I was able to ask for, or I was getting asked for more specific help through that channel. So that somebody would see that and say, like, uh, I had a friend down on uh, Route 2 who had flooded out. I wasn't there anymore, but she knew I had some connections that I could ask for help. She needed another crew of people to help get her kitchen cabinets out. I mentioned that on the signal thread. Somebody saw that. They were on their way down to Montpelier Alive. They mentioned it at Montpelier Alive. Mm -hmm. A crew of people from Timber Homes showed up at her house like an hour later and pulled out all her cabinets. Awesome. Um, oh, and it, and it's, it is... It is I think there is established trust amongst the people on that thread mm -hmm. that everybody is there for the same reason mm -hmm. um, and to help and that it doesn't matter that nobody's in charge. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that. That's really interesting. Yes. So I am Katie's Jules and there was a point where my landlord was saying, get yourself stuff out now. I had huge cases, one of them 400 pounds that I needed to move. And not only did I get four people there, I went to the hub and said, um, do you have any moving blankets, anything like that? Because these are glass and I'm putting them in a truck and I've got to go up a bumpy hill. And uh, they said, no, we don't have anything like that, but we'll get back to you. And I thought, yeah, sure, okay, whatever. And I said, the truck's coming at two o'clock. 45 minutes later, somebody had gone to U-Haul and ended up with a dozen blankets. Mm -hmm. And it was, so So the response was, mm -hmm. to me, phenomenal. Yeah. You know, not only the physical help, but something like a, a little outside the box like that. And then I saw people using those blankets for the rest of the time to, to, to move things. That's great. And so, so it was, it really was the community yeah. helping, you know, like U-Haul donating 12 blankets. You know, yeah. Just, you know, because they went in, somebody thought to go and ask. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank That's you for wonderful. that example. Yeah. Right? And it just strikes me too, right? Again, coming back to the communication channels that allow leadership to be possible and then also the responsiveness, right? And the yeah. following through on what they said they were going to exactly. do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What else? Yes, sir. I just um, sounds superficial uh, any other day, but I, I, I want to give a shout out to Domino's um, <laughs> because they really gave deep discounts for food. Um, I was purchasing stuff for myself as well as all other um, you know, people within the cleanup efforts. Um, and when we missed the pickups uh, at the tent for food, and they really they, they did a great job. That's great. Uh, so I just want to I want to shout out the food. Yeah, thank you. I hadn't heard that. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. really great to hear. Yeah. Good. What else? What else do we see in terms of qualities of leadership? Yes. Well, I may have missed this because I had to step out of the room. Um, I don't know um, how well things work for people who couldn't move fast, um, mm -hmm. people with walkers, people, people in wheelchairs, people who all of a sudden are about to have a baby or something. Um, how did that all go? Did that just happen sort of magically, the way some people are mentioning? I don't mean in a facetious way, but, yeah. but just by saying, I need this and I need that, and it happens. Or should we have developed, should we develop something for certain kinds of people who are going to need certain kinds of help? 
Right. I think that's actually, okay, so that's a really interesting question, right? Like we are seeing examples of success, right? But where were the gaps? And are there opportunities for leadership to develop systems that could address people that might otherwise fall off the radar? Or they have a very specific need that the current systems aren't uh, set up to help? So the one word that she said was magic, and not to diminish, but it, I, what I've heard overwhelmingly is that the community came together and this person did this and this person did this, and it kind of happened by magic. Mm -hmm. But that um, for business owners and people trying to recover, wondering where to go, it seems clear to me that there is not one organization that owns the responsibility <coughs> of coordinating those answers. We have a lot of government institutions, each one of them exists in their own silo, and is unable to coordinate to say, oh, this isn't the silo for you, there needs to be another one. I think that there needs to be an, an organization of some type, whether it's an arm of Montpelier Alive, a totally new thing or whatever, I don't know, but I don't think that it should be a government uh, associated with, with any any level of government, so that that, per, that um, entity can operate outside of bureaucracy and help direct people to the various bureaucratic siloed government entities and other resources that need to be there as well as consider do we have folks that have mobility needs can we rather than rely on one social media platform or another one or a mutual aid platform is there some way that that can be coordinated to blast out to all of those platforms and then collect that information from those platforms and blast out to all of the platforms so that people who don't use text or phones or social media or whatever, everyone can then right. maybe be reached. Okay, great, thank you. And you're really, you're, there's a lot there and a lot of good stuff and you're kind of moving us forward into the next part, right? Of like, what do we need to do, right? But before we, get there and, and go more on that. I do want to just provide an opportunity for other folks too, if we want to talk about, you know, we've talked about the magic, right, that happened here, right? Are there other examples of leadership or gaps that we saw? Yeah. I just, I, I noticed, and I know I heard, um, I think as you mentioned, we don't necessarily need more loans, but I did see, you know, on bank websites, uh, if you're recovering from the flooding, you know, click here for a, a low interest or a zero interest loan. Or, yeah, so I'm watching these other institutions that are, I'm really interested in, there's, there's sort of established government, then there's Montpelier Live, uh, there are people who show up organically, mutual aid groups, but then we also have these established businesses within the, their lanes looking around and saying, okay, what can we do? Yeah. Food, you know, Domino's says, all right, we can do this. A bank says, we, we can provide some capital. So uh, I'm liking watching that and I love what you just said about essentially a navigator or a coordinator or you know air traffic control or something because I think there there is that um, who can connect me with this uh, and, you know. yeah that's great thanks um, I just want to comment too on the, the leadership like and it is it's leadership from a lot of these kind of anchor businesses in downtowns that frankly I don't know about you folks but day two or three I'm like are they coming back yeah. and the fact that some of them have chosen, perhaps in this moment, against their financial interests to do that uh, as part of a larger commitment to this community, I think is a real example of leadership. Yes? Um, I think uh, this was something that happened, you know, in proper honoring time, you know, to pass between the initial tragedy. Um, but individuals and groups that were interested in finding ways for people to come together, not only for labor, but for leisure. Um, and you know, providing concerts, providing, uh, you know, little, you know, food trucks or something like that to sort of uh, be together in easier ways. Um, I think that was a really important thing. And similarly, I don't know who um, initiated this, but there's a really beautiful altar on Langdon Street that I think um, just thinking of the emotional impact and the grief impact for all of us um, taking that like individuals and, and groups that are taking the initiative to honor mm -hmm. that side of it as well I think is has been really important that's great thanks mm -hmm. for sharing that good can I ask I just Please. Wanted, well I wanted to echo the month of your life obviously, which I think has already been stated um, as kind of filling that gap for like who is the person that knows everything and it kind of was 
whoever was kind of stepping up and it wasn't of your, as you mentioned, so I just want to second kind of what you were saying. And I guess I had a question about whether there was a, a sense of um, related to safety, if people felt mm -hmm. like there was a gap. I don't know if we were, I at least was getting Vermont alerts, which mm -hmm. is something you can sign up for for emergency alerts, but I don't know who was feeding into that and whether there could have been more information or a way for people to know, like just in the immediate, as things were flooding, like I'm over by the roundabout near Almond Spring, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of panic, like is it, are we safe, should we evacuate, um, the swift boats were there, how do we, you know, so I, I don't know if that, that's a gap or maybe an opportunity, but just want to yeah. kind of maybe ask some questions about that, and I know there's another group that's thinking the about time, emergency yeah. preparedness, mm -hmm. but in terms of maybe gaps or needs for leadership, or maybe it's just communication. Mm -hmm. I just no, that's great, and I think it's really, I mean, I think we will see resonance between these different sessions, right? But I guess what I'm hearing is, is there an opportunity for greater leadership around that kind of emergency planning or notification or communication? Yeah, it seems like information, like who has the information, mm -hmm. where do you get the information, mm -hmm. who can answer a question, like those are some, and it could be related to safety, it could be related to resilience, but that's something that I think I kind of echo what maybe what you were sharing a little it seemed pretty distributed, and, mm -hmm. and I'm not suggesting that it should be centralized because yeah. I think the decentralization is maybe what made it effective. But just, just there's a balance there, right, between disaggregated and the fact that it's organic and can happen, and yet there's the risk of gaps, and then at the same time, we don't want it to be too centralized where it just becomes a bureaucracy. And yeah, yeah. sir. Yeah, I, I just want to talk about a little bit about the gaps related. Actually, really, it's not just disabilities. What about uh, people who are uh, homebound? What about people who are uh, have, uh, in, in low income. What about people who are in isolated areas? Um, and um, you know, we used to have uh, something called CAN, uh, uh, a capital, capital area neighborhood. neighborhoods, and it sure would have been great if we had CAN there because, for example, in my community where I was a CAN coordinator, I could have gone to all 30 of the homes in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and there were people, but I, I, I wasn't getting information mm -hmm. that I could disperse. Yes, we have all these emergency notifications and so forth, but some of them are technical. Mm -hmm. All of them require uh, computer uh, capabilities. I have people in my neighborhood who don't have computer capabilities. Right. That, that I have to go next door. Mm -hmm. And if I can go next door, and there were people calling me, because I, I used to be the key mm -hmm. coordinator. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting the information either. So can I ask, like, yeah. I'm sorry, I've lived in Montpelier 15 years, first I heard of can. Is that like a, is that, is that still a thing? Is that a thing? No, but I remember it. It, it seemed to have worked better in some areas than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's probably a factor of who the people were who yep. stepped up to kind of yep. get it going. Okay. Um, I think the intention was to create neighborhood focus so that you could look out for the neighbors mutual aid. who might yeah. be forgotten about. It was a form of mutual aid. And mutual aid and mutual communication. Okay. I, I did it in two different communities. Um, and it's true. It works better in some communities yeah. than others. But it but it, it was it didn't have the support of the city particularly. Okay. All right. Thanks for sharing that perspective. What okay, so now I I, I do want to move us forward to, right, and we've already got some good stuff on the table, right, of like, what are we, gonna, not what are other people going to do, but like, what can this group or this initiative, right, move forward? Yeah, Bill. Yeah, Ben, so I, I appreciate hearing everyone's concerns. I, I can offer a little bit of insight about what did and didn't happen so that we don't spend time. There were a lot of questions and issues raised. Yeah. So I'm the city manager for those. Okay, so Bill, I just got to do it. Like, I just want to, we want this to will be brief this and will we're be not going to go quick. like point by point nope. by point. No, right? no, I don't, okay. I'm not rebutting. Great. Yeah, yeah. That's what people understand. So the day that we knew we were going to have flood, we met with Montpelier Live and the team. So we had already pre-deployed the parks department. So it was definitely the city and Montpelier Live. The intention, um, so not, they, yeah, yeah. they did a great job. So that was pre pleased And that was intended to be the hub where people could get walk-in information. The Vermont alerts are by phone or text or email. You can choose, so you don't have to have email. You get a phone call. So the, that system is in place. And um, lastly, just about the resources, we have to communicate with what's called the State Emergency Operations Center for us to get any supplies. So it kind of does need to be a single focus thing. So basically, the hub would tell us what we needed. We'd call the state, get it ordered, and take care of it from that end, and then that related. Bill, can to you give us an example, like a, like what was kind of thing? Water, they, food, water, uh, masks, yeah. gloves, 
all those kind, you know, all the supplies that people had. Uh, and we got, by the way, just great donations from Walmart and Amazon, believe it or not, and those were in the rec center. So there was a lot that people didn't see, like that stuff didn't yeah. just magically show up, it was yeah, all yeah, coordinated. Yeah. And I totally appreciate the concern about having the information. Part of the problem is when you're dealing with FEMA, they don't show up for a couple of days. Yeah. So we were trying like crazy to get information to share with people. And once they came, you know, we started getting, but we actually asked them and they finally put a table at the hub so people could go up and talk to them directly. And now they have a disaster recovery center at Vermont College where all their things are so people can go in and get all their answers. But it's, you know, five or six weeks later. I, so I really, I think that. I just want people to know no, no. And those things as we think about where to prioritize. And that's really, really helpful, right? I think what can appear like magic, right, sometimes right. isn't. Or magic with a little bit of help, right? <laughs> yes? If there isn't precedence for um, retaining that information, there should be moving forward so there aren't any gaps. I mean, Great. Just, so let's start this. Can we put this? Can we just move right now to action yeah. steps, right? Yeah. And there's one right there, yeah. right? Like you're saying, like let's make sure that we learn from this experience. Right. And if there were lessons learned, right, that those are kind of memorialized, right? right? right. Um, I have an idea about that. That's yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. So, so um, one of the other things I think that I, I'm I'm not I. I tend to walk around the city very early. Um, I've, I've lived in Washington County for 20 years, uh, but I'm a super recluse. It's, this is highly important for me, so that's why I'm here, but awesome. I'm Thanks kidding. for coming. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've, but I've, I've worked in this area, and I've been here for 20 years, but, um, and inclusion, colossal inclusion is important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not only that, uh, the, uh, just the unhoused, uh, you know, I, I know everyone has seen this, uh, this woman uh, with no shoes on, uh, walking around um, and sleeping in the dirt part of like where the new bus station is. Um, and, and, you know, it's like we have to be cognizant from, from the, the Jacobs to, you know, this lady. Yeah. And so I just want to keep that moral compass focused. Thank you. I think that, you know, that's an, yeah. As we think about leadership, right, that moral compass is the central, yeah. the central thing, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I guess I'd like to throw out just an idea that I would love for people to pick apart when it comes to like thinking about leadership moving forward, and I kind of think about it into two two buckets. One is the people who are going to be trying to get the financing to mm -hmm. fix the river, and the big picture thing of having to like redirect, the kind of like moving forward future. I would love there to be like a committee, almost somebody who's connected financially or mm -hmm. s federally or statewide. Like, I think there's a moving forward leadership team that needs to happen. And then I would also love a second leadership team of like the needs that need to happen now, kind of like the yeah. Montpelier Alive. But I love the can idea. Like, what if we split Montpelier up into 13 neighborhoods and then those Three lead, 13 leaders from every community go to this other leadership team to like the things that need to happen now. But I really think we need a, a leader in a position that has ties federally, financially, and state government to get what needs to happen. So, like big picture. Uh, okay, so two tracks, yeah. right? Immediate needs, but also that kind of neighbor to neighbor thing, right? That informs the larger, or not larger, but uh, more 30,000 foot level yeah. about like what does the future look like and how do we pay for it? Yeah, in longer term. Yeah. And I should have, I probably, you don't need an introduction, but Sue Minter is here from Capstone, who's been just an incredible leader for Central um, Vermont on this whole thing, and also was the Chief Recovery Officer during Irene. So talk about like the person who knows the lessons we've learned. Sue, I don't know, do you want to just add in or, I mean? I'll simply say that I was also here in 1996. Bill was a young manager at the time. <laughs> and we started what was called the Montpelier Downtown Community Association, which is Montpelier Alive. It didn't exist before this master plan that we developed. And to see how it has risen to the level of exceptionalism in this yeah. moment is so extraordinary. I also come from Waterbury, which after Irene was devastated. And it was our downtown organization then that actually created an, another arm called Rebuild Waterbury. And I think your point about sort of near term, I think what you're talking about is sort of in, what they call in disaster management an after action report. Everything that happened is a learning experience, especially the gaps. 
And I saw so many communities do this after Irene and think about those folks who didn't have access to their meds and the neighbor who did know and go get them. And so I think cataloging that because we know it's gonna happen again and we're gonna be even better, whether it's our mutual aid or our organizational strategies. But thinking ahead, I think it is really, uh, I would have seen success in organizations coming together both to focus on the recovery, what they call recovery, whether it's the businesses getting back or the homes getting back, and there are layers of layers of bureaucracy to access some of the different FEMA programs that have already started to come, and you don't even know about them, the direct housing assistance, which we were just announced. Uh, I don't even think it's been publicly announced, but there are things that are coming that someone really does need to know and be in touch with and then funnel down. But at the same time, I fully support the idea of longer term thinking about the river and how we live with that river and how we think about mitigation. And there's funding around mitigation. So there's lots of future ways of, of living your dream, but it all takes local leadership to start sharing the dream. And I love everything you're saying, and I just commend you. I've been in Barry City doing similar work, and it's hard work. Um, and I really just want to also say it's really important to grieve um, the losses, and I also know that you're doing that. But I, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's I've helpful. seen yeah, different you. forms of leadership emerge out of disaster throughout the month. Thank you, Sue. May I ask as a direct follow-up, since you were here in 96 <coughs> and 2011, the after action reports and these, these sort of plans, rather than us trying to figure out what to do from nothing, there must be existing conclusions from previous floods that we could draw on <laughs> to begin this building process. Yeah, Are I, there was, such I, was, I think even after 92, not only action, after action, but uh, results, they made some investments that I think helped. Now, that was an ice jam, uh, not just a flood. Uh, but I'm sure that there are things to draw on. You also have tremendous expertise in building resilient design. Uh, the Waterbury State Office Complex, I want to say, which flooded out and Waterbury flooded out. We recontoured the entire floodplain after Irene. The Waterbury State Office Complex, we filled in all the tunnels. We built up. We sustained historic preservation. <laughs> and it flooded exactly as designed, meaning it's perfectly usable now. My building in Barry City is 10 years old. Uh, it was designed to be in a flood zone, and every single building around us is flooded and in mud, encased in mud. Ours is just, it flooded right to where the design was. So these designers, at least at this moment, are succeeding. And I think a lot of things that we were able to do after I ring did help other communities. So I'm just saying, I think there are smart people here in Montpelier that have thought a lot about this. And there are reports, some of which are really relevant, and some of which are too old. Yeah. I can really quickly answer yeah. that question. Yes, we do after action reports. 2011 was nothing like this. It was really, totally I mean, we were open in a couple days. It was the basements, that kind of thing. I think basements has been the biggest structure. But the biggest learning piece, so we are debriefing actually tomorrow, we're having our action after action meeting with our own team, like what did we do right, what did we do wrong, being informed about what we hear tonight. Um, but one of the biggest things that came from it was the city's flood hazard regulations that Sue just talked about, and the buildings that did not flood in Montpelier are the buildings that have been newer and are built to code, the transit center, the city center even was built, you know, the, the ones that are elevated that, so that is where we need to focus is how do we, how, what do we do with our old historic buildings that are sitting low, how do we make them, you know, that's one of our challenges going forward. Okay. Great, so I wanna just make sure that we're keeping it on track in terms of um, le actions for leadership. Yes. Hi. Thank you, it's a great discussion so far. I had two points just thinking about yeah. looking to the future. One is I think there's been a decent amount of discussion of resources, especially from FEMA. Mm -hmm. But I think we're at a moment where there are also a lot of other relevant federal resources. You know, there's new, I mean, for many of these, the programs are still being announced, but it's like environmental and climate justice block grants or new investments which are not necessarily for recovery, but which I think could be put towards, uh, you know, more resilient future. So that's, I think, a, 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 a moment of time that perhaps the city can take advantage of. And then I'll share, this is more food for thought. I work in a, a national policy job, and in my last role, 
my organization provided a lot of support to an international philanthropic initiative where chief resilience officers were embedded in city governments. Mm -hmm. So I kind of felt called to this group because I saw the idea about the recovery czar in the commentary. And from just being a part of that initiative in a supporting role, so I don't really have all the ins and outs, mm -hmm. I, think I really observed um, you know, for many of these uh, people who were really motivated and came to that those roles with a huge amount of passion and knowledge, they really were not empowered if they didn't have budget and staff. Mm -hmm. That's such an obvious thing to say, but um, you know, there were major cities that would hire someone in this, you know, incredibly important job directly reporting to the city manager or mayor, and they had one member of staff. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to like design new committees that all the other departments would um, you know, create a filter, review their work through. And I think sometimes they managed to make progress, but at the end of the day, the ones that made more progress were when the city made a decision to make a structural change to mm -hmm. prioritize resilience as a topic. Mm -hmm. And then maybe like public works and housing and zoning like rolled up to that, mm -hmm. as opposed to that person going around and giving ideas to everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, there were much, you know, there were studies of this initiative about what worked, what didn't. I think one other thing which I observed that seemed to work was again when they, um, this was in the case of where people had no staff, Sometimes they manage to influence the structures to kind of change the dialogue over the long term. Mm -hmm. So for example, a city's historic preservation review board had to have two appointees that knew about sea level rise. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well then that's going to change the discussion every time, um, mm -hmm. you know, building the uh, permits are reviewed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little bit of food for no, thought. These are bigger cities, yeah. but I think the... The, you know, there are some similar dynamics. No, I think that's super interesting, right? So, like, I just want to try and boil it down to the idea of, like, uh, is, there, is there a designated position in the city right now, right, that's either that chief resilience officer or recovery czar or whatever you want to call it, right? And, uh, and if there were to be someone like that, how would they be empowered to actually affect change? Yeah. Right? Okay. Uh, Joan? Um, stepping out of my scribe role for a moment. Um, you know, when we talk about leadership in this right now, I feel like there's also an opportunity for us to be um, less sort of exceptionalist and isolationist in our yeah. thinking. Like, I mean, there's certainly issues that are um, particular to Montpelier, and there are so many that are not just particular to Montpelier. So I wonder about what kind of leadership um, structures we can build that actually help us reach beyond the city to both share information and resources, but also to be of more mutual support to neighboring towns and cities. Um, like I was just reading the BT Digger article on Barry City about their housing issues. I'm like, you're not alone, right? We're yeah. not alone in this. And so how can we actually create or and even build upon existing leadership structure, structures where there's already some, you know, we cross, mm -hmm. um, geographic lines um, to help to help all of us mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly what those all are yeah. but I know this I, I think the city like our emergency system right is sort of a collaborative with Barry and yeah. so maybe that's just one example where like oh look we're already doing it in but, some ways but you could also be talking about I mean I'm just thinking about like during COVID right um, where the mutual aid societies actually created a net, like a mutual aid network, right? That BCRD actually helped coordinate, right? That there could be something similar here of flood resiliency around communities in central Vermont or even broader, right? Um, Sue. I will just say that there are recovery committees of different sorts emerging in Waterbury, in Barrie, I assume here. And I think what is so important is that all recovery is local, but the more we can share, and understand each other's um, struggles and and successes. I think the stronger the region is, and you know, I'm also uh, in in Lamoille, the same thing is happening, and that's much more rural. So I, I think um, I super agree with you. But I think starting something, whatever it looks like, is going to be great, and it's going to be right for you. I think thinking about businesses and homeowners and renters and recovery. FEMA will anticipate that you need a particular structure to be able to receive some of what they have to offer. So I'm just mentioning that. And case management will help in the long run. So there will be these FEMA bureaucratic opportunities to benefit from. But however you feel 
you should grow the leadership based on what you've got going here that's so magical and unique is where you need to go. But I do think there are, I know many things that are happening elsewhere. And the sooner you get going and dreaming, I, I so support your view that there's a lot of resources out there in this moment. And I really want to encourage part of whatever happens being the big picture dreaming. Because you got to have the vision and then you find the money. Great, great. Uh, let's go to Nathan and then we'll go right to you. Yeah. Um, you just named vision, which was going to be one of the things I would say. <clears throat> I keep thinking about, you know, when I just think about the downtown, we've got city government in its role, we've got private landowners, we've got businesses who are often tenants and don't actually own the businesses. And that's just one example. It struck me from, I don't know your name, I'm Nathan. Carlton. Carlton. Look, what you said, Carlton, about inclusion sort of designing from the margins. Colossal inclusion. I like it. <laughs> um, but to me, I feel like if, if we have, if we can identify some of the shared values, right, how are we going to go about this? Because I see, just looking at Front Porch Forum, which in some ways is wonderful and in some ways is exposing, I think, some of our um, uh, less noble impulses. <laughs> Would it, wouldn't it be nice if we could all, if I could begin my Front Porch Forum post by saying, through, because we care about inclusion and because we share a vision of X, I think a good path forward is this, and those are that's that's naming an abstract idea, of, and it's naming a value, and it's offering something positive as opposed to uh, what the last person says is stupid idea. <laughs> it's not a good. We can do better. So I, you know, I'd love to see some convening, and, and I think, you know, then if you're the, if you're Montpelier Live and you're most connected to this network of business community, you know, what are the shared values there? And then communicating across those groups, uh, you know, Bill Frazier and the city government can say, we care about infrastructure, resilience, sustainability, whatever those things are. I think that will make communication and coordination for like the 10 year vision or the five year more effective. So I just want to like say it back. So, so like yeah. we're, we're talking about this idea of like having some kind of um, conversation, community conversation about our shared values that inform everything we do, whether it's the vision, the communication, the way that we talk to each other, um, all of those things. But that we this is a moment really to kind of galvanize what are the shared values that we care about, colossal inclusion, right? Things like that. Um, okay, is that yeah? Right? Because you're going to have these different groups, yeah, having their own conversations, yeah. They're not all going to be able to come, come together. So if they, if every time I'm in a meeting with my neighborhood, yeah. one of 13 neighborhood groups, I can say, hey, remember, yeah. we care about colossal inclusion. Yeah. And through that lens, let's try to make this decision this way. That's great. Thank you. Yes. Well, I, I was just thinking, like, on what Sue was saying and even what you were saying, like, the watchword sounds, it sounds like community, communication, coordination. If a lot of the expertise and reports already exist and we don't need to invent, you know, we don't need necessarily sub subject matter experts, like that's not mm -hmm. what's missing, then maybe the leadership gap or where we should be orienting resources to like holding more community meetings and engagement mm -hmm. and providing more information. And like, I don't know if the city has like a communications coordinator or a press officer or someone who's like sharing information or, you know, I'm not saying that's the solution, but it sounds like we have capacity as a community, but like I have never attended a community meeting except that I saw this posting and I saw the front porch forum and now I'm here. And so let's like figure out what, this is the leadership that's happening and yeah. this is the forum, so how do we just get this and, and capitalize, on, capitalize on it? Excellent. Rather than just, you know, continuing what we've been doing. So I, I'm excited about where this is headed and I, I'm hoping to hear some other ideas about it. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. I'd like, to, uh, yep. yes. I'd like to come back. You started this before it was time. And I just want to, and, and yes. whatever she um, said too, this whole idea of trying to collect some wisdom about where, the, where those resources are um, and find you know a system for managing how to communicate them. I think that's why the hub worked. There was, you know, there was initiative, but there was also systems. There were structures, there were ways to keep track of things so that people weren't stepping over each other. And just in my church, you know, there's a little committee that went off looking for where are all the grants we could go for right away. And one person coordinated that such that 
you know, we didn't forget about any of the possible avenues. And that must have been going on in, you know, 50 other places. And somehow, that's okay when it's that immediate. You do what you have to do, mm -hmm. and you go forward. But in terms of the more long-range kinds of larger scale projects, then we need to kind of find a, some way to, maybe there's a study group that, that just does that, collects that information from all those places, and finds a way to then let some of the operative units in the city um, kind of figure out which part of that they want to stay connected to so that it can be, um, continue to be shared more widely and not be, you know, through some sort of one source. So memorialize kind of systems, institute kind of systems that will allow for the collection and dissemination of those. And I'm particularly thinking about all the things that people have mentioned about all these cool programs that we yeah. could access if we right. only knew there were such a thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Look, this gentleman doesn't spoke here. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I witnessed the 92 flood. That's how old I am. Um, and I made a proposal the other day, which I think was in the Times Orders. I, I think it's unfair to ask Bill and his staff to shoulder all of this. Agreed. Yeah. It, it, I think you talked about a, a non-governmental body of some kind. I proposed Montpelier Law. I to clarify or build off of this. We're talking about we have amazing networks of community that are working together. We need to make sure that those continue to have the support that they need and some sort of, someone who's helping to co coordinate resources there, who's maybe not just the city government so that there's enough resources, and then at the same time, uh, potentially bringing in someone to be our resiliency czar, for lack of a better phrase, um, and at the same time making sure that they have the support and the team to then do what they're actually proposing, what they, what they know is the right next step, because that's, was hearing like if we if we have somebody in leadership who doesn't have the staffing that's not doing us any good either so we have a big group of people who need a little bit of leadership and then we want to bring in somebody in leadership and make sure they have enough people. okay all right i think did you have your hand up i did it's kind of a new idea i know we're moving into action steps okay okay go for it Locked up. okay okay yeah um this the i love the two buckets and i think a way that i see an important um interconnection is that when we're thinking of the future of this place um, and the immediate recovery, I'm concerned about building back more expensive and it becoming not something that can be financially sustainable for younger generations. And so I don't know what type of leadership would be able to have eyes on that, but something that checks gentrification, basically, in the, um, in the rebuilding process. Maybe that's the values. Yeah, maybe that's values. the values, yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, yes? Um, so one thing that I heard over and over and over again was communication and collaboration. And so I just want to think about like, what's something we can do right now mm -hmm. to maybe help bolster that? Um, and like thinking about what worked, the hub, maybe a lot of people don't know this, but the hub like just created a website. Websites were working, um, social media was working, Front Torch Forum was working, but we were also missing out on people there. So like, how can we, like can we, find someone, like maybe even a volunteer, to like really like root these in like a permanent like place where it lives where everyone can come look at it and we can see when the meetings are and we can see when um, like, you know, high schoolers can access it. Cause like I'm 20, I was working with high schoolers, they were just texting their friends and that's how people showed up, you know? Yeah. Uh, or through the hub. So are you talking about like, uh, sorry to overuse the word, but like a communication hub where all different um, channels of communication can be employed to s spread information. Yeah, like something that lives like in one spot, I think yeah. was really, really helpful in person. And so maybe creating a website, because I know that Montpelier Live had a lot of information, but Montpelier yeah. Live and the people at the hub are actually different people. So yeah, yeah. there was some communication breakdown yeah. occasionally. So maybe like one website right. that gets like... Or even just or a shared like, understanding yeah. of like, who's in charge of talking about this thing, right? Like, so that there isn't kind of cross purposes or confusion. Yes. So I'm, I'm just kind of reiterating on, on something you said, but I was thinking about reiterating it before you said it, but the, what we're looking for is leadership for now for recovery, yeah. leadership for the long term yeah. for resilience, and there has to be, what was your word, colossal, colossal inclusion, inclusion involved yeah. In, yeah. in that process. So really, leadership that looks at our values and whatever we build mirrors our values. Okay. Yeah, so
Excellent. Thank you. Uh, yes. So, uh, bringing a lot of things together, there are a lot of resources about what has happened in the past. There are a lot of communication resources. There are a lot of ways to raise money. I think what we need most is an organization that identifies, look, your job is to understand what are all the ways people communicate, and that it's your responsibility to know that. You, you understand what are all the funding ways that we can get from the government, and that is your department to sort of know that, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But uh, again, unfair to ask the city to take on that extra burden. The city's got enough to do. Yeah. Montpelier Live has enough to do. Yeah. So I think it needs to be oh, some of you experts. Some of you experts. I do want to. I'm just, sorry, I just thought, <laughs> sir, did you want to share something? Sure. Um, it's kind of a value and an idea um, somewhere in between. I guess it's a it's a suggestion of a collaborative dynamic with city government. Um, I fully re you know appreciate frustration in city government, but at the same time I worry that you, what I don't what I hope doesn't happen is an adversarial dynamic as this moves forward. That I think the the problems are extremely complicated. They go beyond the city of Montpelier. So whatever is pursued is done collaboratively with city uh, government and officials. Um, in addition to whatever else happens. Great, yes, thank you for that, absolutely. excellent. Yeah. Sue? Yeah, I was just gonna say all of this is really on point and there are so many lessons learned from previous events and I do think it's really important for it not to be a city responsibility <coughs> because to your point, they're, they're gonna have their hands full dealing with FEMA yeah. and they're gonna be able to help the, whatever organizations you build um, get more resources through FEMA and you're going to rely on ongoing fundraising and I definitely just want to amend that it not be volunteer. You've got to hire someone. Yeah. You have to create a structure where you can hire people. In Waterbury, we, they hired uh, a case manager, a volunteer coordinator, and a construction coordinator. Mm -hmm. And that was for 115 homes. Sorry, there were 230, but 115 got rebuilt by Rebuild Waterbury. That was a, no, an offshoot of the existing 501c3, re, our revitalizing Waterbury, like Montpelier Alive, but it had a whole different arm, different agreements, but they didn't have to establish a new 501c3, and were able to raise the money to get every member of their community back in their home. So it didn't solve every problem of those members, but it was inclusive, it was fundraising, it didn't rely on FEMA, and they were the first standing operation, and they were the first one done. And that process happened in 13 communities across the state, and guess what? The least, the most low-income people took the longest time to recover, but our state didn't demobilize until every Vermonter was back in a home. I hope we get, are able to do that again. We have many more people and many more housing challenges, but I definitely want you to realize you've got to hire people, this is a two to three year endeavor, at a minimum. And then there's the long term. I mean, that's the short term is two to three years, I would anticipate. And Waterbury raised 2.3 million. Thanks. Waterbury, 2000. Sorry to speak out of turn, but I don't want any of this to be construed as adversarial with the city. Thank you very much to Bill and the city for everything that they did. But this is not another new thing. It's just it's on top of it's no. already existing response. That's great. I, I just want to quickly recognize people that have their hands up and then we're going to, I'm going to read back some ideas I think of, of what we saw to prioritize. Yes. Okay. One of the ideas that we keep coming back to is something and can is on the table, lunch can. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be on there. My opinion, it shouldn't be can because that didn't stick. But I think a real open communication of something that that maybe is a little more post-disaster oriented. I'm not sure. Um, are, are are we talking about like some kind of um, uh, network of na neighborhood network? Some sort of network. You don't need to call it can, but like something, yeah, yeah. But something along those lines. But some something that I think needs to be envisioned a little more from the ground up. Okay. By a group. Okay. Um, and I think as long as we, as Nathan was saying, we emphasize shared. Values. That's got to be. I'm, I'm a cynic. I, I, I am. Goofy. I, don't I get all. I don't believe. Oh that. my God! Am I a cynic? <laughs> talk to my wife. Um, but the truth is, watching stuff play out on front porch farm and watching people get adversarial, that the the fact that everyone's has this spontaneous, you know, expression of shared values that has come out of all this. They're like, if you'll pardon the poor metaphor, the rock in the stream and the water just flows around and everyone's forgotten 
that they said that. And okay. Just move it on. Thank you. La uh, yeah, please. Okay. I think one thing I've really heard is just the affirmation of the strong community and the need to build a more inclusive community. And I think from your point that it's not feasible for this to be all volunteer long term. I think it's really inspirational that people are coming out with so much enthusiasm and giving their time, but yes, it's, it's inequitable long term to expect that everyone can yeah. come and engage uh, without any kind of yeah, compensation. Um, I think as we're also thinking about, and this is almost counter to what you're suggesting with the neighborhood-led initiatives being post-disaster focused, I hope that if, if something longer term were to build out of this time, you know, right now the focus is recovery, but longer term there are going to be other issues, and having that strong framework can help people be more prepared, and you know, you look at like Maui, they were, mm -hmm. you know, that, that community was prepared for coastal hazards and they were not prepared for that hazard. So I think it's important for us to think about, right now everyone's talking about flood, but there are a lot of other, um, heat, you know, crises that smoke. could, heat. Yeah, yeah, heat and smoke, so, yeah, and I think all yeah. of those crises will benefit from, or not crises, but the community will benefit from having that strong infrastructure in place, whatever it is that like comes next. Yeah, I just mean by post, it's after, but post what we know now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I wanna, this is either going to work or it's not. But <laughs> like, I honestly, the most important thing to me here is the process, right? And so I'm trying really hard to listen. And Joan, you got to help me out with this. Like, but I, I, I feel like the things that I've heard the most enthusiasm for are this kind of uh, a hub of leadership that goes in two directions. One in the short-term recovery, and short-term being two to three years, right? Mm -hmm. And like, a central place where resources can be. Uh, uncovered and, and, and shared, right? And then on the second part of that is this kind of long-term community engagement process around the long-term vision of resiliency for Montpelier. I feel like that is one action step, that two-track approach. Yes. Can okay. I ask, mention one thing, because you said something really important that I didn't want to get lost, and it is about getting back into the city, a resilience, a position whose job it is within the infrastructure to sustain the work, because Irene happened, and we had a lot of intensity in the areas that it happened, and then it goes down, and it has to be sustained. So I do want to suggest that. Yeah. I'm not supposed to make suggestions. Yeah, I mean, going going back to kind of Nathan's <laughs> idea, right? Like, show me show me your budget, and I'll show you your values, right? Yeah. That, like, we're really talking about values. Do we value the person enough to, to fund it? Yes. Yeah. I just want to add an addendum to my comment earlier. That's yeah. accountable leadership. So innovation, resilience uh, has been thrown ar around a lot, and that's all well and good. But you know, you're, say what you will about local government, but at least you can hold people accountable through elections. And I do worry a little bit about like a position or positions where there's very little accountability. So in, ensuring that that's a core principle as yeah. whatever yeah. happens goes yeah. forward. Okay, I really just want to. I'm sorry, I have to like do this. I have, it's my own anxiety, but I really want to be able to stand up there and say that we came up with these three things, right? So one <laughs> is this kind of two-track of leadership, right? I think uh, one other thing that I heard a lot of residents on is just. Uh, colossal inclusion, right? That all the leadership, all the work that we're going to do in the coming years, both the long-term vision and the immediate recovery has to start with the principle of a colossal inclusion, right? And bringing everybody together. And that um, I also heard a lot of, I think, a lot of interest in um, fostering or empowering existing networks uh, of mutual aid and neighborhood connection. I think that's a good one. And never, and continue to build. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to suggest that those are the three and things. I think communications and communication. keeping that communication hub is really essential. Right. Sorry. No. Nope. Well, All right. I heard that a few times. So, to say it one more time, uh, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about when they say, "Oh, what are you? What are the action steps here?" One is two two track approach of uh, hub for leadership, short term, long term. Th two, the colossal inclusion in everything that we do. Three, uh, empowering and fostering things that we worked, whether it's uh, mutual aid societies or um, neighborhood networks. And then four, uh, just uh, centralizing, centralizing, is that the right word? Sure. Communication. Excuse me, Ben. Yeah. Values. Right. It's got to be in there. It's got to be like the base, the, the number seed one thing. of everything. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Are we good with that? Yeah. Those four things, but everything's about the values. Yeah. Okay, I would take out centralized about communications yeah. and call it forward. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. Like an amber alert, almost for Montpelier. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> Coordinated communication. Great. Oh, ready to go. Yeah. Can we have a round of applause for Joan and Ben? And <laughs>